Oh, do that with two laps. Kelsey, do you want to hear this or you want to go with play? All right. Welcome, everybody, to April. I think it's April 13th, April 14th. Something. <laughs> April 13th. I don't even 13th, know. 2021. Um, this is Taco Tuesday, sponsored by the Washington State School for the Blind. My name is Diet Snyder, and I'm the Outreach Director for Birth to Three Services. And this is Krista. Hi, I'm Krista, parent. <laughs> She's a parent. She's also a teacher of the visually impaired for the outreach department here at um, WSSB. Right. And we have a special guest tonight with us. Kartar Coral Khalsa is a, a, a former colleague of mine, and she is an orientation and mobility specialist who has worked with um, babies all the way up through school age kids and we used to work together at a program in Arizona and so I wanted to invite Kartar here to talk to you guys about orientation and mobility so I'm um, Kartar go ahead and introduce yourself and talk and I'm gonna share my screen with your powerpoint okay great um hi everybody it's so so nice to meet you um, as Diet said, I'm a I'm a I'm a retired orientation and mobility specialist. Um, I taught for 37 years, and over the years, Diet and I were um, have been friends. We've been colleagues. We've been classmates. While she was working on her master's degree, I was working on um, uh, improving my knowledge and skills. Because if you don't want to become a dinosaur, you keep taking classes your whole whole life. Mm -hmm. So that's how we know each other. Oh, she dragged me off to a quilt store once and got me uh, hooked on quilting and probably a whole bunch of other bad habits too. But in any case, that's how we know each other. And I'm really, really honored to be here um, with you. I want to tell you that I'm, I'm informal. So if you have a question, interrupt me, uh, post it, and Krista's gonna, you know, interrupt me. Any of you, let's make this casual. You don't have to hold off till the end, and I don't want anybody to be shy. Um, so, um, uh, what was I gonna say? Uh, yes, I wanted to give you a, a little, little brief history, um, and that's the fact that orientation and mobility is a field that started in, uh, around um, uh, post-World War II, and they worked with adults. And uh, when I very first began teaching, you know, we were working with children, but what we used to call vanilla blind kids, kids who were only visually impaired and totally blind and of school age. So preschoolers, children with, with multiple disabilities, um, um, babies were getting absolutely nothing um, in the way of orientation and mobility. So when Diet and I worked together, people were beginning to consult on um, preschoolers and the birth to three population. But I, I think I may have been the first or among the first to actually provide direct services to, uh, to babies, you know, up, up to three years of age. It was the very end of my career, the last five years. And as it turned out, it was the best five years. So you're not gonna get what's new, exciting and different. I've been out of the field now for almost 10 years, but I hope that I can share with you um, the body of knowledge that I developed over to almost four decades and some personal experience and maybe something that you can use um, with your child. So Chris has gone on to the first slide. So let's get the boring stuff out of the way first. And that is, let's get down to definitions. The field is orientation and mobility. And if you are working with a professional and you say, see um, C-O-M-S behind a person's name, that's certified orientation and mobility specialist. And that person has gone through a university education or certification to, to, uh, to practice this in this field. Orientation, is knowing where you are in relation to the rest of your environment. And the O&M specialist will help you, you, you and your child to form the skills to figure out where the heck you are. And then mobility builds upon that to form the skills to get uh, safely and, and as independently as possible to get where you wanna go. And that's just the, the dry nitty gritty of what orientation and mobility is. Um, 
again, interrupt me when once I get going, it's kind of off to the races and I'll go a little bit fast. You know, vision inspires us to move. It influences the development of our motor skills more than any other sense. And so if you don't see, and maybe you're not um, motivated to go somewhere to move and to reach, if your child can't see you and can't see your face, they may not be inspired to reach. Um, and and our, our babies, our toddlers, they learn by imitation. And so if they can't see what you're doing and what the other children are doing to imitate them, then, um, then again, movement and development are going to be slower than they would if that child could see. So would anybody, and don't feel pressure, but if you would like to share what inspires your child to move, what gets your kid moving, crawling, rolling, whatever it is that they do, anybody? Okay, it's all right. Again, could jump in now or jump in later, um, but it's fine. Okay, Krista. I was trying to think of anything and I can't think of something. Okay, tell me a little bit about your child then and, and let's uh, let's see what uh, if we can figure something out. Okay, um, her name is Linnea. She's mm -hmm. 20 months old and she has a mitochondrial disorder. She's okay. Deaf blind uh, with hypotonia and sure. cognitive delay, cognitive mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. things and um, she has she has some hearing that's aided by hearing aids and her vision is very very low. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Okay. Well, I at the very end of the uh, program I I included a, a resource on um, activities in functional routines and of course Diet probably says functional routine every other word when she's working with you and your families. And, uh, and there are many, many activities that can be done in functional routines with, with uh, children with dual sensor, sensory impairments. Um, and, you know, if vision is not going to be her primary mode for getting information, then, uh, then maybe hearing is. Uh, but um, but let's let's move on and let's see if we can't pull some things out that are Close going to help your child. Hi. Hi, Addie. Hi. Hi. Sorry. <laughs> I'm so glad you came to the meeting. Hi, Addie. Okay, are you gonna sit and watch and I'll keep talking? Mm -hmm. Okay, here I go. Um Okay, go ahead, Krista. We um, concept development. You're going to hear uh, about this as you as you go through um, your child's education and working with your early intervention specialists. Concepts are just ideas, and we take these ideas and we build understanding of the world around us. But mostly, we learn our concepts through visual images. And what do they say about like anywhere of 75 to 90% of what we know, we know through vision. So when we're talking about children with visual impairment, what we need them to form concepts about are their own bodies, an awareness of their own bodies, the names of their body parts and what they do, an awareness of where their bodies are in space, uh, spatial and positional concepts, uh, you know, up, down, be behind, below, on, off, things like that. And then environmental concepts. Uh, and this is a lot of times it just comes down to vocabulary, a sidewalk, the lawn, the grass, the, uh, the porch, the cement, things like that. So when you are out with your child, you're talking and defining and exploring constantly to build these concepts. Um, I don't, oh, there was something I wanted to say about, um, let me think, okay, that's going to come up later. Um, the basic foundations of um, um, movement are, the first one is reaching, and we, we've got this little guy here, this guy I began working with at about six months of age, and saw him all the way through age three and off to preschool. You can't tell in the picture, but he's up on his knees. So the simple act of putting something in front of him that was attractive has him reaching with his hand, coming into kind of like a half kneel position. He's got his head tilted back to use his vision. vision. So everything he's got is, um, is coming together to help him to develop and to move. 
if any of your children are are maybe now pulling up to stand, maybe at the end of a, a, a at the edge of a coffee table, you'll see that they're also turning their heads and rotating their trunks to see what's behind them. They're letting go with one hand, so now they're using their balance to um, uh, to stay upright. And at some point, they are learning to to creep, to crawl, to cruise, to walk, to run, and I. I don't know if anybody has seen this. There is a, I saw a, uh, on Facebook, a YouTube video of the many, many different ways that children move. And it's absolutely a riot. So let me just tell you, there's no right or wrong way for your child to get um, from point A to point B. Some are great little crawlers, some scoot, some bunny hop, some do like a combat crawl where they kind of push along with one leg. We had one little boy, Diet will remember him. He's, I've got pictures of him later. It was like a little spider or like a little Pac-Man. He could go you know, in any direction um, and incredibly fast. Um, but the way children move, what we call their preferred form of movement. And um, sometimes maybe a child begins to walk initially and you think, oh, he's walking. And then he drops to the floor and starts crawling again. Our children will, will continue to build on their prefer, preferred form of movement, but will often drop back to a, a previous form of movement when they are feeling unsafe or insecure. So your walking child may drop to the floor and wanna crawl to feel safer or maybe to explore more closely. Um, for any of your children, what are what are their preferred forms of movement? Are you are we walking? Are we crawling? Are we rolling, scooting? Anybody? Um, Linnea is Linnea is doing a little bit of rolling, and mm -hmm. she I think unintentionally scooches across the floor when she's on her back. Her squirm uh -huh. makes her move footward. Uh huh. Uh huh. Sure. Anything is acceptable. Um, you, you might wanna try putting her on her tummy and maybe working from behind to kind of, you know, push her feet forward, putting something um, enticing in, in, in terms of something that's brightly lit or a sound source or something that is attracted. So we can get her on her tummy and, and moving and maybe coming into something that might be a, a, a form of creeping or crawling, but uh, they figure out their own, um, preferred forms of movement early on and through through therapy and intervention, it refined those movements um, at, at some point, okay? Kartar, I'm gonna interrupt you for just a minute. Yes, please. Somebody just came into the meeting from a phone. Can, um, whoever that is, can you just um, unmute yourself and tell me, um, tell me, tell me who you are so that we know who you are? Two five three nine eight five five three four six. Hi, um, this is Donna, and I am also with Tiana here. She is a six-year, a uh, five-year-old, almost six-year-old student. Awesome! Thanks for coming, even on the phone. It's awesome that you're oh, here. Thank Great, you. thanks. Hi Donna, how are you? I'm Kartar. I'm the I guess I'm the main event tonight. It's good to meet you. Thank you. You as well. Okay, we'll just keep on then. We're talking about the foundations of movement and what gets children moving. So go ahead, Krista, next slide. And Kartar, just so that you know, I'm 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 moving the slides. Okay, sorry, I keep calling on the wrong person. Thanks, Dee. Um, okay, let's talk about crawling a little bit. Um, because Walking is like the gold standard of mobility and we all want our children to walk. Some may never walk, but crawling is one of those things, don't rush it. If, you, if your child has some motor skills and they're beginning to creep and crawl, don't worry about walking at that time because crawling is a real, crawling and creeping are, are very, very, very important um, uh, a, a stage of development. I'll tell you a brief story, a personal anecdote. I had a family living in my guest house uh, from India and they had a little boy while they lived with us and they were just determined that he would walk. They were constantly from six, seven, eight months, standing him on his feet, walking him around the room, propping him up against the furniture. And lo and behold, he did walk at eight months. He never crawled, but he walked. And so one day, just for the fun of it, this was while I was working in infant services with Diet, 
I put him in a four point stance. I just basically, you know, put him on his hands and knees and he just fell on his face. He had no upper body strength. He couldn't support his own weight. He couldn't crawl. Once he started walking, he dropped back to crawling and crawled for a very, very short period of time. But the act of crawling would, would have built the upper body strength that he needed in his neck, his shoulders, and his arms. For our children with visual impairment, being down on the floor up close to everything, that's how we learn, uh, by tactile touching and looking at, at a, a close vantage point. And it also, it, they say marching does this, like a military march. It balances the hemispheres of our brain. And so for some of our children who have midbrain involvement, crawling is just a really, really, really important developmental uh, uh, phase that we want to go through. So if your child's crawling, let them crawl. Um, this is an important stage of development that you don't want to rush through. Um, my little boy that I was talking about, we continue to be close, but he's to this day at now age 12 has low muscle tone. He's not strong. He does, he rides a bike, but can't climb monkey bars, can't uh, pump himself on swings. He missed a really, really important stage of development. And so, yeah, let your kids crawl. It's important. Okay, DF, please advance the slide. So let's figure out what, uh, what gets your child moving. We talked about this a little bit earlier. Um, you're gonna notice something, and that's that uh, I'm gonna go ahead and get the, start this now, though it comes up in another slide, um, that nearly all of the pictures that I use are pictures of children that I have worked with, and they're nearly all outside. Um, because I, um, I find that, you know, the, the home is a very, very familiar environment, so much so that our kids will sometimes just be complacent in a familiar environment, but boy, you get them outside and the breeze is blowing and the birds are singing and there are smells, sights, sounds, interesting new voices and people. And, um, and even a, a child who's a little sleepy and not in a good mood will perk right up. And I, I, I'm coming to you from Phoenix. Uh, we're looking at, um, um, you know, 100 degrees uh, real, real soon. But even in these hot days, I would get there and say to the family, let's go outside, you know, just for 10 minutes and sit on the patio, maybe under the ceiling fan. Um, uh, because I'm, I'm just a firm believer in just experiencing the whole environment. Um, well, Tartar, you yep. will be really happy because our group okay. has already communicated to us that part of what their favorite activities are outside and walking. Good. So we've good. got a lot of parents that love to take walks good, good, with, good. Their, with, their, with their kids. Fabulous. That's how we do. Um, and outdoors, you, you know, I used to take kids in the heat. We would go to those mall playgrounds. I mean, if it's too hot to be outside, we'll find one of those little mall playgrounds. And I'm like, bring the hand sanitizer. I know there's lots of germs, but just let's get out there. I'm going to, the, the, for, um, the fourth bullet down, put them through your paces. Okay. Yeah, should I say it? My, <laughs> I, um, <laughs> in our culture, we have these plastic baby carriers that we, that we, and for the convenience of it, we'll carry our babies around. And sometimes they don't leave that carrier for long periods of time. And I'll tell you something. And so I'll, I'll apologize in advance. I'm not a mom. I, I never had children of my own. I know it must be a lot of work to schlep them around over your shoulder or in a pack. Um, and so I, I'm going to be the last person to say, you should do this and never do that because there are no absolutes in parenting. By the same token, do your best to have your child who doesn't see well or hear well near your body. Let them feel what you're doing and how you're moving um, and feel the rhythms of, of how we walk. Everything that you do, you're walking on cement. You've got your baby in your arms or in a backpack or in a sling. Um, if is going to feel different to him or her if you're walking on cement or grass or up a hill or down a hill or you're you know over the sink washing dishes or whatever it is you do. If your child is close to you or on you or touching you, 
they are, are, you are putting them through the rhythm and pace of natural and typical movement. And you want to do that as much as you can. And yes, it was a horrible thing, but we used to say, bucket babies, we carry our children around in buckets in our culture. And, um, and you don't see that in a lot of other cultures where they are carrying their babies on their backs or in slings. So I just want to encourage you to let your child feel the rhythms of your movements. And that's going to go a long way for their development. Okay, Dee. I'm going to talk about vision a little bit. And the reason is because uh, you know, when I very first started teaching, we didn't work with kids with low vision, and um, but yet the ability to use vision, whatever you have, um, impacts your mobility. And so for our children with low vision, there are typically three um, um, characteristics, and the first one is poor depth percept perception. If your child is crawling, walking, however it is they get around, you see them sticking a hand or a foot forward, maybe when they're moving from the tile to the carpet or there's a different, uh, uh, the cement to the grass or something like that. Uh, it's very difficult to see when the elevation of, of the walking surface goes up or down or it changes. That's poor depth perception and it's related to whether the child has monocular, uh, monocular or binocular vision. Photophobia is, is just a big word for being sensitive to light. Um, and nearly all of our kids with um, low vision have light sensitivity. Uh, and then the last is the opposite, the ability to see in dim lighting conditions. When you have low vision, you often need more light to see. And towards the end, I'll offer you some suggestions for um, making your, your home environment more visually accessible so that you can deal with some of these um, impacts of low vision. Okay. People will often say, well, will glasses fix it? Are glasses going to help? Uh, sometimes, just remember that, you know, when I take off my glasses, I don't see well enough to drive, but when I put them on, um, thank you, cataract surgery, I see better than 2020. And so, um, so yes, for some of us, glasses are the, are the fix it. For our children who have a, um, the, the, the word that we use is refractive media. Something doesn't work. There's a problem with the retina. There's a problem with the optic nerve. There's a problem with the cornea or, or the lens. Um, something is actually broken, then glasses are not going to bring it up to 2020, but they are going to improve visual acuity, the sharpness with which we see. And the other is that they're going to improve um, eye alignment. So, for example, um, Many of our children will have eye misalignment. The eyes don't line up personally. One, a, an eye may deviate outward, you know, towards the temple or inward towards the nose. But glasses, the lens, the prescription has what, what I call a sweet spot. The clearest vision is right there in the middle and the eye will seek out that sweet spot and try to look through that place where the vision is the clearest. And this is how Glasses help to improve um, eye alignment. And then the last one is glare protection. Put your sunglasses on and put your sunglasses on the children. And I'll show you a, a little bit of, of, of the difference between a child using glare protection and a child who is not. So yes, glasses can help. A lot of our children, our babies and toddlers don't wanna wear their glasses. You could, it's, it's a real uh, wrestling match to get their glasses on, but we would do it. You know, the mom would have one hand and I'd have the other and we whip those glasses on as fast as we could, still holding onto their hands and take off and just get them used to wearing them and just in increase the time. Yes, Dr. Snyder. I was wondering if there are parents here where their kids do wear sunglasses when you go outside. Um, and I know that often we live in a very um, environment where it might be cloudy, but also glary. So do you guys have, do, do your kids wear sunglasses? Katie's shaking her head. Okay, uh, Mar Katie and Krista, do you, do you feel like, is your Natalie child squinting? Has, Natalie has something to say. Yes. So my son, he's five now, and uh -huh. he got diagnosed about a year and a half ago with achromatopsia, mm -hmm. and 
juvenile degener um, macular mm -hmm. degeneration. And so sure. before we knew this, we knew that he had a huge light sensitivity because he would just walk off everything. Yes. He didn't have any depth perception. And so we started wearing sunglasses at a young age. And he actually was pretty good about keeping them on, which I think uh -huh. he realized they were helpful. And then recently we were able to get with his prescription, um, a red lens to help ah. contrast. And we noticed that has worked really well. Uh -huh. But before that, we just had the regular, you know, his let, um, eyeglasses uh -huh. with you know, lots of other things to them. And uh -huh. um, the adjusted for the sunglass part uh -huh. of the positions. Uh -huh. And, but uh -huh. I noticed with red lens works night and day difference for him he's he's still you know pretty aware and mm -hmm. of you know the different mm -hmm. steps and so we've been really looking at textures or like for easter sure. egg hunts, i tell him i want you to look for the egg shape object in the grass mm -hmm. because, uh -huh. you know you'll think a leaf or uh -huh. something else is uh -huh. an egg so sure. yeah we've definitely been working on that a lot more and just mm -hmm. with the instruction and mm -hmm. it, it's been night and day helpful i am i'm so glad that you chimed in natalie because in that two slides you're going to see some children that you that you you should be friends with that you would recognize achromatopsia is one of those eye conditions that is very rare often mistaken for other eye conditions and so you've got your diagnosis when your child was four or five this is not at all unusual and meanwhile all this time you're trying to figure out why your child is falling off the porch and walking around with their eyes closed. Um, and, and at one point, I and I have had in my 37 year career only three kids with achromatopsia. Uh, all three of them are in this presentation. So we'll talk about that a little bit more, but thank you for chiming in. Do you know why um, the red lenses um, are, are prescribed for kids like your, like your child? From our specialist in Spokane, he just uh -huh. um, stated that it'll help with some contrast. Absolutely because right. He, because he only sees, Kelson only sees in, you know, black, white, and gray. There's absolutely yep. no color. Yep. Yes. And so this will help him expect, and then with the sunlight, because his cones don't work at all, yes. he can't filter this. And so everything is like completely brightened and then everything's yep washed out and so yes. this helped bring it back and darken it enough where hopefully he can mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. see some contrast between different things so it's not mm -hmm. everything is just a blur so you, but I you, have seen definitely more of a difference with the red lenses good uh, which which is definitely helpful you have an outstanding um, eye care practitioner working with you and, and between the two of you, you've worked out a really nice understanding of, of, the, uh, of, of, of how you, your child's eye condition works and it sounds like you're in the right glasses. So, um, so excellent. Um, let's move along and we can talk about this some more. So glasses do improve clarity of vision. I put this picture in, I just thought you might enjoy seeing a baby picture of Diet. So, um, and this was from the infant and preschool program that we used to run at the agency where we work together. Go ahead. And here's our children. The guy on the left um, needs to be wearing his sunglasses. He was one, the one that, um, <coughs> excuse me, went uh, kicking and screaming for wearing glasses. But when you're outside and your eyes are what, 80, 90% shut down, you just don't see. And then a little boy on the right um, is, is your child, Natalie. This is a child with achromatopsia. And again, these achromatopsia kids, we don't get them until they were almost on their way to preschool because they would be so late with the diagnosis. But these glasses are prescription. This is what the uh, low vision optometrist put us in. And this little boy was running, playing, climbing, sliding with these glasses on and I would add to put a hat on your child because that's going to cut glare another 45 or 50 percent and the difference when they are wearing these um, um, red lenses and a yellow a yellow tint in glasses will also um, help with contrast is just remarkable so uh, so yeah love that you're on the right track um, 
I think I have pretty much said most of this. Okay, you're from everybody's familiar with transition lenses. We used to call them photo gray, uh, photochromatic. Um, again, I, I wouldn't go without them. I have them in my glasses. And so I can't say enough good things about, uh, about um, photo gray lenses or transition lenses for any of your children who wear glasses. Um, a hat with brim, if you can get your child to wear a hat, don't put a hat on just your child. Everybody put on a hat, and then so we get our, our kids to, to comply with their um, uh, uh, low vision requirements. It's just that everybody does it, and they will too. And then the very last one, um, here in Arizona, the average age that we develop cataracts is maybe 45 because we're, we have sun every day. Um, and so even for all of us, but mostly our children with low vision who are even more susceptible to the development of development of cataracts and other eye conditions at an early age. Yeah, put your sunglasses on. If you can get your child to wear sunglasses, even if they're over the counter, um, uh, 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 by all means, um, put sunglasses on your child. Katie. Yes, yeah, so um, my daughter got glasses probably close to a, mo most of a year ago now. Yes. Um, and when she goes out in really bright, like sudden, really bright daylight. She does sort of squint mm -hmm. and turn away, but sure. if, it, if it's not super bright and sudden, she doesn't seem bothered by bright light. And okay. I was trying to make the decision of whether to get the, the transition lenses. Those are the ones that turn dark in the yes. light, right? Yes. And I, I talked to some people on her intervention team. I was wondering, you know, if she has low vision, will decreasing the light into her eyes make her less able to see? Well, I'll tell you, if the lenses, if the uh, sunglass uh, lens is too dark, yes, it will cut down so much on visual resolution that she will, won't be able to see. Um, but that's the, that's the nice thing about the transition lens. They darken, but they don't get black dark. And okay. so, um, so yes, I would recommend it. And I will tell you this, with regard to your child's response, when she goes outside and she's just um, suddenly bombarded with that um, um, bright light is that if you can put the glasses on before she gets out there or you know just put or, or just set the glasses in the windowsill such that they begin to darken before she goes out we would do this a lot with glare protection put it on before the child hits the bright sunlight mm -hmm. and then they don't have just that sudden onslaught of light into their eyes mm -hmm. and that will help uh, and, and our children also will have a very uh, slow light dark adaptation time. So you and I, we, our, our, our eyes might adjust in under 30 seconds, but some of our children will take up to two minutes to uh, adjust to changes in the lighting condition, like uh, coming in from a, a bright daylight into the house or vice versa. So yes, try, try putting the glasses on before, you sit them in the windowsill if they're the transition to darken a little bit. Um, yeah, I think transition would be good. And you can and you can you can experiment with that. Because, um, one of the things that I find with, with pediatric ophthalmologists often is that they're working with a child in a clinical setting, but they don't go outside and walk around the parking lot and see how hugely impacted your child might be with glare. And so you can point that out to them. We've had eye care practitioners who will come outside with us so that they can see what we're talking about, but it doesn't always occur to them to prescribe glare protection and it makes a huge, huge difference. Um, does that answer your question or does that help you? Um, yes, I think it does. Uh, the the damage, dam sun damage to her eyes have been my concern, but um, mm -hmm. I was wondering if, if it would get too dark to, mm -hmm to impede what vision she does have. But mm -hmm. yes, that, that answers that question. Okay. Um, no, the transitions my... don't get as dark as those okay. dark, dark gray. In okay. fact, the, little, uh, the slide that uh, Diet has up now, the little one on the left has albinism, which is also an eye condition that is uh, um, uh, involving a lot of photosensitivity. And she's wearing a gray transition lens. And so you can see that she's still getting light. She's still getting visual resolution, but she's protected from the sun in those glasses. Um, and I will talk about, I'll, I'll mention just real quickly, 
gray is the one color of sunglass lens that doesn't distort color. When you're looking through a gray lens, you're seeing color just as it is. And then here's yet another one of my little achromatopsia children for Natalie. And uh, again, our low vision optometrist couldn't get her into her red glasses fast enough. And, um, and she did beautifully with them. Okay. All right, go ahead, Dee. I'm gonna move along to some mobility ideas. Out now. You know, we've talked about vision a little longer than I intended to. Am I, how am I doing for time, Dee, yet? Should I just prattle on? Yep. Okay, Alrighty. Let's talk about push toys. Um, I used to get into uh, pitch battles with one of our physical therapists who's like, we don't need toys. When they're ready to walk, developmentally ready, they'll just walk. And I'd be like, yes, but if they can't see they're fearful of walking. They don't know what's out there. Let's just put something in front of them to, to encounter the environment, you know, a couple steps ahead and see if we can't get them moving. And I used what was ever available. I didn't go out and buy expensive mobility devices. I bought the little popcorn popper, little shopping carts, little toy lawn mowers, little toy vacuum cleaners, um, whatever I could get the, the child who was pulling to stand, who was reaching with one hand, you know, was ready to let go, but just couldn't take off. I put them behind a push toy and I got more than a few kids walking. And here's this guy. Um, this guy, uh, I, I never saw him at home. This is a daycare center. And I took this little walker. It was designed like a little, um, like a little mail cart and he could deliver things and pick things up, which he loved to do. Um, we would walk up and down the hallway of his daycare center and he'd get uh, to the end of the hall and hit the wall and just scream and cry because he was stuck. And I kind of taught him how to nudge it around. And as soon as he figured out that he could manipulate it and turn, he was running track up and down that hallway, inside, outside. Um, this he, he began to walk. So I graduated him to one of those little popcorn popper toys. And one day he's just walking along and he dropped that thing from his hand and walked. In a daycare center, I called his mother up, he's walking. And so so we, we did it with push toys. And I, I just can't say enough, a push toy will, it, it just gives a bumper. The child can, through the pushing the push toy around, feels the ground surfaces, bumps into things and, and, and the, the sound that it makes, whether they're bumping into metal or glass or wood or toys or whatever, everything that that push toy in front um, uh, contacts gives that child feedback about their world. They feel safer. Don't worry, they won't be pushing around toy shopping carts when they're 14. These things will eventually drop away and they will develop skills and develop age appropriate tools. But for this, this two or three, four year old age, these push toys are perfect. This guy, you can see his left hand in his uh, lap. This child had a stroke at birth and has cortical visual impairment. He was not a mobile child, as I recall. He could, you know, creep a little bit on his tummy and roll, but that was the extent of his mobility. But we put him in this little sports car with his feet sticking out the bottom, and he was all over the patio. Whatever you can use that you have at hand or you can find at a garage sale or buy on Amazon, to help your child just feel their the movement of their bodies, put them in a swing, um, just anything um, will work to promote their development and movement. Let's graduate a little bit higher because I know we, we have the parent of a five-year-old and so we're talking school age or nearly school age children. Some of the skills that, one of the basic skills that we can use with our children is what, when I went to school, we called it sighted guide. Now they call it human guide. What the, the idea is that you have the child, rather than you hold on to your child's hand or wrist, let the child hold on to you. So I would choose ch just like two fingers and let the child grip just your fingers. And that way they're, they're walking at your side, but just a tiny bit behind you. And through their hands, the, I put in one of the bullets, information gathering antenna, the palms of their hands, they feel when you're walking up and down. They feel when you're going from cement to grass. Um, you're slowing down, you're speeding up. 
And you, you know, you know the, the, the two-year-old who just wants to pull away and go out on his own, when that child has the choice of holding on to you rather than pulling up, being pulled along, they will often, they feel like they've got some control of the matter and, and that, that them holding on to you is a choice. Try this with your children who are, are walking or on the verge of walking. This dad just never quite got it, but look at my little boy here. His father's got him in a vice-like grip. Let's see how his hand is curled around his dad. He's trying to hold on to his dad as if he were walking with me. That's how I have taught the child to hold on to me. And dad is holding on to him. He wants to do the holding on. And, uh, and this is what I would encourage once your child is walking is do human guide, what we used to call sighted guide. Another basic skill is trailing uh, to explore. The child just basically uses one hand and follows along a wall, um, a surface. Uh, you can trail visually just by looking at the edge of a sidewalk uh, where, where um, sidewalk meets grass. But anyways, trailing is just maintaining contact with the surface to get information about the environment. And here's my little Casimir um, uh, trailing with his hand. Got him in his hat. Couldn't get him in his sunglasses today. Go ahead. Let's talk about cane travel. Um, is anybody anybody's child using a cane yet or anticipate using a cane? It could come. This is so, Donna. Yes, I'm uh -huh. sorry. My, do my daughter uses a cane. Okay. She has since she was probably about two. Oh, that's so excellent. I'm so happy to hear that. When I very first started teaching, we didn't start kids with canes till they were 10 or 11. And this was way back in the 70s. But uh, yes, we're using canes now with children as young as 18 months. And I'll tell you what I began to notice. I had one little girl that was picking up a pool noodle and, and exploring her environment with those styrofoam noodles. Another little girl, her father had a, a, like a wet vac. Uh, he was clean, uh, clearing water off the patio and the metal tubes that attached to his vacuum cleaner, she was using it as a mobility device. And I began to see these children picking up whatever they could get into their hands and exploring their environments with it. And I'm like, these children are cane travelers. What are we waiting for? And so we get them started with, as cane travelers at a very, very early age of, you know, as, as, as young as 18 months, which is about what this guy is. He's coming up on two years of age. We use the cane to explore our environments. We use it for protection against uh, 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 hazards. A hazard is something that's going to hurt you. Quite frankly, in, in, when you don't see well, bumping into thing is one thing, you're gonna get a goose egg, but falling off of something is where you're really gonna be injured. And you can see my little guy here. He knows there's a step there. He had to step up it to get into the little playhouse and he's using his cane to find the step and, and uh, approximate his distance to the step so he can step down. And then the last thing is, a white cane with a red, the red tape at the end identifies the person carrying it as somebody with, with visual impairment. And these canes now, they, they can, you can get these canes in all colors and, uh, you know, cute little pinks and pastels and things like that. Just be aware that all 50 states have white cane laws on the books which prescribe the cane for a person with visual impairment as white with a red tip. So, Let's move along to who's going to be a cane traveler. Um, it's it's a, 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 a foregone conclusion if your child is totally blind and is, is mobile enough to walk, that child's going to be a cane traveler. Severe visual impairment, same deal. Some of our children, you know, are, do pretty well, are independent in certain lighting conditions or certain times of the day. Um, quite frankly, our, our Achromatopsia children, for example, they do pretty well after the sun is down with, with uh, seeing and may or may not um, uh, need canes, but, but during the day, they're, um, they're pretty visually limited, limited. And then under certain travel conditions, maybe you do real well in your workplace, but you sure wouldn't go out and cross the five lane street without identifying yourself as somebody with a visual impairment. This is, um, I, I put this in, don't, don't, don't pour over these numbers. Uh, many of you 
some of you may have been given a, a visual acuity uh, that describes the clarity of your child's vision. Others maybe not. When they're real little, it's pretty hard. It's, it's, it's difficult to figure out. But Dr. August Kolumbrander has studied visual acuity. And so I just stuck this in because maybe two, three years from now, somewhere down the line, you might, um, you know, you might have this number and you're thinking, is my child a cane traveler? He's been diagnosed with a visual acuity of 20 over 400. Well, then you can look and see that, yeah, that visual acuity is going to slow him down. Maybe he needs a cane to support his use of vision. So this is just a guideline of, um, of when, uh, the level of visual acuity impacts how a child travels. If you're going to get a cane for your child, here's where to go. We used to call them kitty canes. There's actually another company that I think calls their cane a kitty cane. But should you want to order a cane for your child, it comes from a company called Ambutech. Here's their website. And the cane that that we use, my, my, my little Sammy here is carrying, it's an aluminum mobility cane. The round tip on the end actually rolls and it's kind of heavy. So for a child this age, it's nice because it, it um, weights the cane down a little bit to the ground. It rolls back and forth so they don't have to have real super duper motor skills to move it. And where the, the tape is red, you can get green, pink, orange, blue, whatever you wanna get. And they're very cute when they're little to do that. They're not gonna be out in traffic. So we're not worried about them having the official red and white. And should you be ordering a cane for your child in the, in the say, the 18 months to three years of age, you will order anything from 20 to 2 to 26 inches. And if your child is maybe four or five, and again, depending on the development, you're looking more at like 26 to 30 inches for a cane um, for a child. Okay. Now, I've already talked to you about foot uh, push toys. Um, you will see and hear the phrase AMD which stands for Adapted Mobility Device or Alternative Mobility Device. Go ahead, Diet. And these are what, um, they've been around for a long time. This is not a new thing. I, we've had AMDs now for easily 25 years. Some of them have gotten patents, but basically it's a cane with two shafts instead of the one down the middle. And so for a small child or a child with multiple disabilities, this is an easier cane to manipulate than a, than a cane that has to be like moved back and forth to, uh, to explore the environment. Um, this is the two shafted cane that is made by Ambutech, the company I just showed you for the, for the little canes. This one, I, when I was teaching, uh, was not in existence and I was unaware of it, but I, I looked at it when uh, Diet gave me the website. This is um, uh, developed by a colleague of ours. It has a patent. Basically, it's hard. It, you may or may not be able to tell by the picture. It's actually belted around the child's waist. Okay. I, I, I like and respect the person who came up with that cane, but what I will tell you is this. In my practice, as an orientation mobility specialist and five years working with this age range, I wasn't huge on these two shafted type canes. This child, for example, yes, he can run up and down the sidewalk with that device, but he can't step up and down with that around, climb a, even a few steps. He can't bend over and pick up a ball. He can't climb a monkey, monkey bar. He can't get into a swing. So I'm like, okay, run up and down the sidewalk, but, but I am more about a, a, a push toy or a walker or a rig, something that he can just drop to the side and climb that slide and slide down. So I, the, the AMDs, these alternative mobility devices, they come and they go and they keep getting reinvented. Um, and for some families, they're perfect. So as I said, Dr. Zakin, the young woman, the, the professional colleague of ours who, who uh, came up with this idea and patented this idea, all the respect in the world for her. This was not a, uh, uh, the way I went professionally when I worked with this population, but you will make your own choice in that matter. Okay. It's really yeah. individualized and mm -hmm. so whatever Absolutely. works. And, um, and I do know mm -hmm. some um, O&M specialists who make um, AMDs out mm -hmm. of PVC pipe that are very specialized for mm -hmm. the child. And mm -hmm. so I, I, I just think that it's really individualized. There's not mm -hmm. one mm -hmm. tool meant for everybody. 
Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yep. It's a very positive way of putting it and absolutely true. Look around your house. I talked about um, visual accessibility and safety in your house. And when your child goes to school, walk around the classroom and see these very things. Can you, um, can you see the doorways? Can you see steps? It was not unusual at all for me to go into somebody's home and they're telling me, well, he keeps falling down the steps, you know, going out to the patio. Well, the I caught traffic yellow duct tape on the edge of the steps and we have now made a very dangerous set of steps visually accessible to that child. I used tape. We would put molding on the wall. We would put shakes to designate certain things. Um, another thing that is when you're two, when you're three, everything is a head high hazard. The, the countertop, the edge of the um, dining room table or things like that. They sell things at Home Depot or you can just invent things with foam just to keep your child from just constantly conking his head in the same place until they outgrow that head high hazard. You wanna keep your clutter to a minimum in your house so that they're not tripping over things. Um, one of the worst injuries that our children account, uh, uh, encounter are um, a door that's left just like half open. That visual plane, that area that a door, what is a door like this wide, like two inches or so, and yet you hit your head right on the edge of that open door and there's an injury that is gonna bleed and is gonna hurt. So either close your door or push it all the way back to the wall to keep those obstacles in the vertical plane out of the way. And again, increase the lighting. You know, you might wanna save electricity, but light that dark hallway so that your child can see and improve the contrast as best you can. I used to, I would help um, a physical therapist in my school district evaluate children. And she would have a blue, like a therapy exercise mat and a blue playground ball and wanna test whether the child could, you know, uh, catch a ball or roll a ball. Well, you can't, the child could certainly do that, but not a blue ball on a blue exercise mat. There was no contrast. So do what you can to improve contrast in your environment. Uh-huh, Katie. So my daughter um, recently had a change in her diet and is moving into ketosis. And with that came more energy. So she's spending more time rolled over onto her abdomen lifting her head up a little bit higher mm -hmm. and with that has come multiple times where she's um I haven't been with her I've had her somewhere and been elsewhere in the house and I hear her crying and she smashed her face down oh. on something uh -huh. hard first time it was the the base of a wooden like activity gym that I put uh -huh. on uh -huh. the second time it was the handle of a shiny mylar pom-pom that I left mm -hmm. on the floor with her mm -hmm. and so I'm feeling that's a whole new big realm of like mobility, baby proofing, safety. How, yes. how do I think about protecting her in that stage of de development? She wears her glasses most of the time. So I feel like sure. her eyes are less vulnerable, but her mouth uh -huh. especially. Mm -hmm. I think that just what we talked about, see if you can find ways to improve the contrast. So so if the, the handle of the toy that she smashed her mouth on is, is very similar in color uh, to the surface that it got left on, she doesn't see it. Um, uh, maybe put her on a, a, a mat of some sort that is that it is light in color, such that the toys are easily seen against it. If you if she's uh, bumping her head on a on a step, um, again, some of these uh, accommodations they're not gonna like get you on HGTV for the beauty and grace of your home, but your child is going to be able to see the edge of that step or that table leg or, or something like that. That's probably one of the biggest things is just to improve the contrast between the obstacles that are causing her a problem and the background of, of those things. Um, I, I, she, her vision is so low that I'm, I'm thinking this means just getting rid of everything in the house that's hard that's at mm -hmm. level. That's Does illumination help? Um, can you bring more light on the subject? I don't know. I mean, I haven't tried. So yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Katie, I think that that's definitely something to kind of really take an inventory about where she's at mm -hmm. in your house. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. um, just create a space for her that she can still explore and, uh, and move around 
but make it safe for her. And there's a variety of ways that you could probably do that. Mm -hmm. I, you know, don't hesitate to use a, like a flashlight in the, in her immediate vicinity, just to improve the illumination around her play area. I uh, went to evaluate a little boy one time and I would bring all kinds of flashlights and play toys. And I, I, I would let the children hold them. I put a flashlight in his hand. He immediately began to run around the house and shine it on things, uh, wall outlets and, uh, you know, things on shelves he brought the illumination to the things that he wanted to get a better look at. So, so I'm going to say contrast and in, in finding ways to, in, even if you have to just, you know, put a high intensity lamp, a, a, a LED lamp on, on the floor itself so to improve the illum illumination around the area where she plays, see if something like that might help. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, your child, some, some of you are already in school. I worked birth to three, and here we're, we, I'm, I know we're talking to parents with uh, children up to five, but when they transition into school, um, get mobility in that IEP. So often, maybe it's not available. Well, if it's not, it's that school district's responsibility to find it. Um, I, I transitioned, I nearly got fired for this one, Diet was there. We, we were transitioning a child who was totally blind into a public school program and they didn't want to provide mobility or they're like, oh, well, we'll evaluate them sort of like when we get around to it. The child was blind. It was a new environment. I insisted that they get it in writing before they left. And the special ed director of that district wasn't happy with me. I didn't mind um, because this, the, the child um, is, is guaranteed this related service. And when your child is going into a new school situ situation, you want them to be, at the very least, looked at by an orientation and mobility specialist and ascertain that the, that the playground and the classroom are safe and visually accessible. Uh, go back well, one. Okay. Claire, I think we have just a couple of minutes. Okay. Left. Well, I am like two slides away from being done. Go ahead. Sorry, just want sorry, you to sorry. know that uh, I'll just, I'll just t give you this one. This little boy, go back one, Dia. The guy on the left, okay? I knew him from the time he was two or three, and he did not walk till he was three years of age. And that's what his mother would say. I just want him to walk. Well, he, he not only learned to walk, he um, has crossed the Grand Canyon rim to rim twice and summited Mount Kilimanjaro. So yeah, he didn't walk till he was three, but he made it. And he's a voter uh, specialist for voters with disabilities in the Arizona Secretary of State's office. The girl on the right um, has achromatopsia and uh, is a fourth grade teacher in the school district just a couple of miles where I live. So I want you to just, I want to leave you tonight with hope and optimism for your children's future because uh, it's going to be bright. I promise. Work with your specialist. It's real fun being with you. One more slide. Go ahead, Dia. Okay, this is just silly. This guy came up years ago with thinking that little horsies would be great mobility aids. This website isn't even here anymore, so it wasn't an idea that stuck, um, but I thought you would get a bang out of it. I don't know how you'd walk up the block without uh, developing a huge entourage, but they were very cute. So we're always coming up with new things. And last slide, I just wanted to leave you with a few resources. Dr. Farrell, for the first one, Reach Out and Teach, is Diet's professor. And uh, this book, every page of it, will give you something new, exciting, and different to, to build on your child's skills. Family Connect, the next one, is the American Printing House for the Blind, um, Parent Mobility. This one I didn't find a lot for the, the, the birth to three or four population, but it's got these great activity calendars with all kinds of activities for mobility things in your daily routines. And then lastly, a deafblind worksheet and Marjorie Wood is highly respected for working with um, uh, 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 routines with children with uh, um, dual sensory impairment uh, from Austin, Texas. So so, uh, so yeah, there you go. Um, uh, Dia, give these people contact information for me if they would like it, there we are. Um, but otherwise, I'm so happy to be with you. I had fun. I hope you did too. 
Well, Kartar has a way of packing lots and lots of information <laughs> in, so I'm sure that your brains are exploding, but we can certainly, you know, um, talk about these concepts um, with your orientation and mobility specialist, um, and, um, and uh, we can, um, God. I, I just lost all of my words. Um, it's coming. Does anybody have any questions or comments or anything that they want to share with Kartar before we leave? Thanks, Natalie. She said it was great. Thank awesome. you, Natalie. It's lovely spending time with you. Great. Thanks, Katie. Is this right, information we could pass along to them? Next, next month, we are we have a parent advocate advocacy person from Washington Pave joining us. Mm -hmm. So next week is going, next month, sorry, is gonna be a, another great Taco Tuesday. So everybody have a great night. Good night, enjoy. Bye. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye -bye.